And hello once again, everybody. Of all the current writers researching the field of UFOs, ETs, secret weapons technology, and other enigmatic and occult areas, perhaps none is more controversial or respected than Jim Keith, who has, to date, authored over ten of the most intriguing books now on the market. Jim's latest book represents another intriguing look at an unknown and highly controversial phenomenon. Its title is Casebook on the Men in Black, and it is published by Illuminet Press. Men in Black incidents straddle the realms of mysticism and science, occultism and UFOs, material reality and fantasy, partaking of all, defined by none. Since ancient times, these mysterious beings have stalked the planet, and in recent years they have tried to silence witnesses of UFO sightings with threats, harassment, and even worse. Who are these strange beings garbed all in black? Are they government agents, aliens, creatures from another dimension? Well, in Casebook on the Men in Black, author Jim Keese traces the path of these unusual visitors through history and presents startling evidence about their origin and their purpose. So let's say hello now to my guest tonight, Jim Keith. Hello, Jim. Are you there? Hi there, Jeff. Yes, I am. I want to thank you for coming on the program. I've been trying to get you on this show for a long time, and it's overdue, so uh, we're going to have fun tonight. Casebook on the Men in Black. Uh, How much research went into it? I imagine uh, quite a bit, since you're talking about a phenomenon that apparently goes back a long time. Well, you know, I don't want to sound like a... um like a hoary old gray beard or anything, but I've been interested in, in the paranormal and conspiracy since, um, since I was a kid. And I've been hearing about the men in black really since the 1950s. And so I guess you could say that I've been researching them all along. On the other hand, I did bust the books and, um, and get on the Internet and contact everybody I knew over a period of six months to find out everything that I could uh, uh, just recently to write the book. Tell me what, uh, as, a, as a kid in the 50s, you heard about the men in black. I didn't hear about them. Well, you know, I was a big UFO book, uh, a big UFO buff, I should say. Sure. Um, back then, I, um, I I bought Hook, Line, and Sinker, the uh, the writings of guys like George Adamski and Truman Berthram, who believed that or, or said that they had uh, taken uh, trips to other planets and UFOs. Right. And the Men in Black, uh, you know, were mentioned sporadically back then uh, in connection with early UFO incidents, like, um, for instance, the Maury Island. Um, the Maury Island contact, uh, the Albert Bender uh, contact with Men in Black, and so I, I sort of heard about them um, out of out of my peripheral uh, ear, mm-hmm. and uh, I, re- I recall as a kid always, you know, just kind of uh, keeping keeping my eyes open for neighbors who I thought might be aliens. <laughs> Well, there's a good imagination for you. (laughs) Uh, You know, all you had to do is go to the theater and see something like Invaders from Mars or It Came from Outer Space, and any kid with an imagination is off to the races. Yeah, not just kids either. You know, there's something to be said for those uh, early UFO, uh, those early science fiction movies, in a way uh, shaping the content of people's abduction scenarios and what they experienced. For instance, those big-headed aliens are, are really not much in evidence prior to the 1950s when they appeared in the movies. Not to say that, that uh, UFO contact isn't real, but I think it's a, it, that it has a paranormal aspect that is also shaped by our minds. I agree. You know, uh, speaking of that film, and I've, it's, I guess it's available in video stores, Invaders from Mars, the, the little kid uh, looking through the telescope, watching people uh, fall through the sand and uh, you know into the underground chambers. That movie has always raised issues in my mind. Did, did the people somehow writing that film have information or contacts which fed them information? Because we're talking about a film, 1953, that has abductions, implants, uh, a drone race serving a highly evolved being, which uh, you know has a rather large head and not much of a torso, and I believe just a, a few long tentacles or something. It was a very interesting film. And I found it to be uh, rather suspiciously well informed in retrospect. Yeah, remarkably so, because usually um, contactees back in those days uh, were more often visited by uh, these sort of tall, Aryan, blonde-haired uh, characters rather than rather than uh, big-headed aliens. It uh, it was a kind of a full-blown um, prediction of the experiences people would start to have, uh, really starting about the '60s. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And then the other one I really liked was, uh, I think it was Richard Denning, uh, It Came From Outer Space. Remember that one? I, indeed I do. Uh, one of my other failings is having been a monster and science fiction fan as a child. 
Well, that's wonderful. I didn't, you know, I'd rather do that than sit down and watch MTV for 40 hours a week. I guess so. So it came from outer space, the, uh, the craft that looked like a meteorite. It really wasn't. It was a ship. It landed in the desert. It was in trouble. And the, uh, the beings on board wanted simply time to repair it and get the heck out of here. It reminds me of the October 13th meteorite overflight uh, over Los Angeles, which has been termed by a number of people as actually a spacecraft that uh, landed in Northridge in the hills there at Rocketdyne, was repaired and took off. Uh, we're going to do a program about that again quite soon. But uh, again, a very prescient kind of plot. Yeah, and you know, uh, it's not completely out of the question that the movie makers at that time might have been contacted by um, by people who had a vested interest in this, because uh, in FBI memos, CIA memos back at that time, they pretty well assumed that they could influence the media. Um, uh, one example of that taking place somewhat later is President Nixon deciding that the movies and the TV should portray all of these crime-fighting motifs, at which point all of them started to do that with the untouchables and so forth. Exactly. And, you know, you really confirmed a suspicion I had. I don't want to, to, to lean uh, too far in that direction, but uh, it does seem pretty obvious that the possibility, it was uh, certainly a very viable one, that some people in the film industry at that time were getting uh, some information because the plots were r really advanced, if you think about what we know now. Sure, it could easily have been. Men in Black. Uh, you talk in the book about uh, how they've been uh, really around for... Uh, thousands of years. They certainly weren't wearing uh, two-piece suits, you know, 500 years ago. But uh, when you talk about Men in Black, what's the old-style interpretation of how they appeared? Well, in olden times, they were thought to be agents of the devil. And uh, uh, they would be seen at a witch's sabbats, and they would be contacting people and having them sell their soul. And they, people would ride to these, um, uh, to these witches' conclaves on pigs, and there would be a man in black um, officiating at some kind of a sacrificial ceremony or so forth. But really starting about the 1900s, uh, more often you see the men in black seen in a technological um, context, mm -hmm. uh, usually seen in conjunction with uh, a witness who has seen a UFO. And the men in black will show up at their doorstep, often in groups of three, and uh, warn them not, not to say a thing about it. Kind of like Jehovah's Witnesses. Indeed. No kidding. Just door to door. And this is a, we have a historical precedent going back to the beginning of this century that that was going on. Right. Well, actually, you know, the door-to-door -door kind of thing, uh, warning against the uh, the supernatural or the occult uh, or the or the UFO thing, didn't take place back in the Middle Ages. Like I said, it was mostly they were thought to be agents of the devil. I see. But in but in the uh, 20th century, apparently, the devil uh, is not uh, uh, quite so believable of, of a figure, and so these men in black are um, usually trying to hush people up about their occurrences with the UFOs. Oh, interesting. Have you run across uh, very many people in your research who claim to have had direct encounters with these men? I've run across a number. I've collected literally hundreds of examples of this, and I, I must say it is truly a strange phenomenon. When I first uh, went into uh, um, studying the issue of the uh, men in black, I was extraordinarily skeptical about um, about it, and particularly about the paranormal element. But uh, after after digging into a lot of these cases, I, I found I just couldn't ignore them. There were too many credible witnesses. Uh, there were too many people who didn't uh, apparently have an axe to grind about it. Mm -hmm. And I've come to uh, believe that there is a kind of a paranormal men in black, as well as other um, other uh, uh, solutions uh, for the man in black as well. I don't think that you can categorize every man in black uh, visitation as being paranormal or as being government or as being hoax. I think it's a mixture of those things. Well, it could be a guy just who happens to like black suits. Well, indeed, you know, that might be... Um that might be considered the delusion aspect or the fish story aspect of Men in Black. A lot of the uf ufological subculture, people who are really into this, are um, they do tend to weave quite a web and, and believe that everything that happens to them has something to do with UFOs. Like I said, when I was a kid, I was always seeing uh, sinister uh, aliens out of the corner of my eye. I wonder if there really were any there. <laughs> Uh, that's a uh, that's a good question. You know, uh, a bit later, I um, I did have um, an encounter with a gray, and 
I'm really more well known for talking about the government connections uh, with UFOs, but I, I, don't, uh, I don't discount the alien slash uh, paranormal aspect either. Oddly enough, many of these uh, men in black are oriental or oriental appearing uh, with slanted eyes, sometimes uh, dark or ruddy skin. Um, another detail that we often uh, have heard about is that their fingers are very long. And uh, some of these guys walk in a, a stiff uh, or mechanical fashion and sound like machines when they talk. I, this, I, I know this sounds like um, something out of the, out of the uh, science fiction movies from the 50s that we were talking about. Sure. And that, that, uh, that is truly uh, one of the odd things, is that these guys are uh, really the weirdest uh, characters that, uh, that anyone has ever encountered. Now, these descriptions that you're reporting come from a variety of sources over, uh, I guess, a fairly uh, wide area of geography. Uh, it's mostly in the United States, but on the other hand, uh, most of our media in the United States uh, is... is um is centered here so that uh, perhaps we're not hearing all about the uh, the men in black encounters in the in eastern asia or whatever i do have i do have um, accounts in england in australia a few of them coming out of china but primarily it's in the united states are they wearing black there as well right no kidding yeah that you tell me they're driving uh, 1967 cadillacs in peking uh, that's right no 